this is a one-on-one -on -one with the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress for the 2020 general elections, John Dramani Mahama. He has been on uh, the campaign of the various regions so far. He's done about eight regions, uh, quite a number to go. He's been interacting with people, uh, special groups, interest groups, the chiefs and supporters of the party. Well, we're engaging him to find out how the grounds has been and what um, he thinks of his chances for the elections in a few days' time. Good morning to you again, yeah. Your Excellency. Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you too. You have a message of recapturing power. How has the campaign been so far and uh, uh, what do you think you've been able to win with respect to the trust of the people which you lost in 2016, uh, which led to your defeat? The campaign has gone well, very well so far. And um, it's always good once again to connect directly with the people. We'll be meeting the chiefs and the people in their communities. And um, in this particular case, what I did was not to go to the constituency capitals, but to choose two or three locations within the constituency so that you go actually into some of the rural areas to see how conditions of life are. And um, times are quite hard. I mean, all the people that we have spoken to uh, are finding it very difficult to make ends meet. And um, one thing that stands out is um, the appreciation uh, to the NDC government for a lot of the infrastructure that they have in terms of electricity, in terms of clean drinking water, in terms of schools, you know, chips compounds, health facilities, you know, and so many other, other things. And um, they believe that the NDC should come and continue from where we left off. There's also the case of the abandoned projects. I mean, almost all the projects we're working on, uh, just name it, police stations, clinics, you know, uh, schools, roads, you know, wherever we, what, wh wherever we left office, you know, most of those projects have been abandoned by the new government, of course, because they have their own priorities, you know, but um, the people are not happy about that. Um, they want a continuation of those projects. And um, they want a, a stronger economy. The economy is in serious crisis and it's creating a lot of hardship for people. Now, now you, uh, your opponents have said that uh, the seat of government is not for experiment. You have come, you've had your time, yes, it's fine, so you can go and sit back. But you have retorted by saying that you're coming back to uh, right the wrongs. Uh, what five things do you think that your come, with your comeback you would be able to do? Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not experimenting. I've, I've done it before. People have seen my track record. Yeah, and then I, I, I don't think I'm coming to do any experimentation. I'm going to do it, take it to the next level. We did well with infrastructure. That, that is undisputable. Um, my next focus is taking it to the next level with upscaling skills for young people and finding, giving them the skills so that they can find a place in the world of work. You know, that's uh, what we want to uh, take it to. But <clears throat> if you talk about hindsight, you know, maybe things that we could have done better. Yeah. It is that connection with the masses. Um, having been a minister of communications all the way and then being a vice president, you know, I had this direct communication with the masses. <clears throat> Once you become president, you have a, an information minister, you have all kinds of people, and you're not allowed to continue to have that direct contact with the masses. And so I've done that correction already. I mean, when I became the flag bearer, I did a speak out tour. The speak out tour took me directly to the people and discussed their issues with them and also shared my perspectives with them. And so if I become president, what I'll do better is to make sure that I'm not cocooned in terms of communications. I'm going to go down there, you know, and speak directly to the people all the time so that they understand, you know, exactly what you're doing. That gap gave an opportunity for the MPP to fill it with a lot of miscommunication. Okay. And um, part of their propaganda was successful, and that's so what that's won one. them. The two? No, you asked for one, and I'm giving you one. No, no, no I said five, though. Well, oh, maybe five. Less, yes. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I can't think of any other, you know, like the other time. Yeah. I said, <clears throat> we did a lot of work in infrastructure. Maybe there are some other places that we should have paid more attention yeah. to. Like I said, skills upscaling. Mm -hmm. It's one of the major things that I'm going to 
uh, be dealing with. Our economy is changing and um, <clears throat> the kind of people that the job market is demanding mm -hmm. are people with uh, skills. And so um, in the mining sector, they need drillers and blasters. Mm -hmm. They need um, excavator operators, crane operators, and so on and so forth. The bulk of our young people go through secondary school yeah. without any, uh, come out without any skills. If they're not able to continue into university and other tertiary institutions, then it means that they come out and they are not employable. And so we need to re-divert them and then give them some skills mm -hmm. so that they're able to take the jobs that are coming up. Yeah you know, in the world of work. So we don't have enough secondary technical schools. Uh, we need to uh, increase the number. Mm. Uh, we need to um, open technical vocational training centers, mm. you know, where young people can go for short term, yeah. you know, training, fast training, um, expanding um, uh, institutions like NVTI, National Vocational Training Institute, mm. and providing them with more, you know, uh, training equipment to be able to I mean, fast track training of young people so that they can also find work to do. Mm -hmm. That should be uh, the focus we have now. Of course, mm -hmm. development will continue doing, infrastructure will continue doing. There's a need to uh, uh, re reconstruct the roads. There's a need to provide more hospital facilities, especially um, if we're going to implement our free primary health care program. Then it means we must build more chips compounds, more polyclinics across. And everywhere you go, the chiefs tell you, we want you to upgrade our clinic to a polyclinic because our population has increased. And so all those things are things that we we'll, hmm. would we'll look at. When you go around, a lot of uh, the chiefs that you meet, they, they tend to sing your praise. They, they say the NDC government has done this and that for them. What's your reaction to this? Well, um, one can't but help feeling, you know, honoured, and um, it's 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 not a it's, I was going to say it's a pleasant surprise because I, I've known the massive you know kind of infrastructure that we did during our time in office, and so um, I find it you know uh, normal when they acknowledge the things we've done uh, for them, and a lot of them trans transformative because. Mm -hmm. If you give a community electricity, you transform their lives completely. It makes them able to do small businesses and so on and so forth. If you give a community clean drinking water, it prevents them from walking several miles to go and get water. It also uh, prevents them from coming down with waterborne diseases. You know, those are all social interventions that are important. If you give a community a school, for instance, a secondary school, community day school, their children don't have to go far away to other secondary schools. They can get secondary education right in their, in their communities. And so I'm not surprised when the chiefs express appreciation. But are, you, are, you, are you comfortable with the praise singing? Because most of the subjects do uh, link it to the fact that they are engaging in active party politicking, so to speak. Are you <coughs> comfortable with that? Well, why not? They are not, they are, I mean, saying what the truth is, you understand? And um, if you say uh, participating in active politics, it means that they cannot stand for elections, you know, and so they cannot stand for elective office. Okay. That is what the Constitution seeks to bar them from doing. Yeah. But it does not bar them from speaking the truth. I mean, if while you were president, you provided critical infrastructure to a chief's community, I mean, what stops him from, you know, extolling you for what you did? There's nothing in the constitution that that stops you. Do you um, think? Do you think that maybe the law should be relooked at? Uh, re no, no, I don't think again? so. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. We just bar them from taking part in elective politics because they are leaders of their communities. And how would it be that a chief gets involved directly, uh, standing for parliament on the ticket of a party? or something like that. I mean, it won't sit well at all. Mm. And that's why we barred them. But, I mean, as for speaking, we guarantee free expression. Okay. And so there's no reason to stop them from saying their minds, you know, about what they think has actually happened. One million jobs. Uh, you are coming back with the message of job uh, creation, skills, development, uh, like you have said. What is unique about this policy and do you think that uh, this is c covering enough the masses? 
<coughs> there's a disconnect, you know, uh, in, in respect of recruitment and placement. And so we're going to cure that first by rejigging the national, um, and the, what, what we call the labor office. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to turn it into a national employment center. And we're going to digitize it, put it online. We're going to get young people who have come out of school, who have um, got some technical skills, technical university, and all that, to go online and put their particulars and their qualifications and everything on the uh, website of the National Employment Center. Now, we're going to encourage um, employers, if they're looking for a certain set of skills, to go on that uh, website and then pick eligible people from there, either interview them, test them, and if they meet their standards to employ them, and we'll give them an incentive for doing so, some tax incentive, tax rebate, depending on the number of people you employ from that website. So it will create a contact between young people and employers directly. Some of them might need a little retraining you know, on the job to fit into a particular role. They are free to do so and then eventually employ them. So that will allow them. Young people, one of the things um, that they have a problem is when they come out of uh, school, there is virtually no connector between them and employers. And so you see they take applications and CVs and they walk from business to business and be dropping their CVs in those places. That will, you know, take that away. Then the next one is um, the big push. I've talked about it. We want to invest about $10 billion uh, over five years into the economy. It will go into various sectors. And one of the sectors it will go into is providing social and economic infrastructure. That will kickstart the construction sector again because we've said that the companies that will participate in the big push will be principally Ghanaian companies. And so these Ghanaian companies would employ from the Ghanaian labor market. And because it's going to be Ghanaian companies, they'll pay taxes here. They will invest whatever profits they have back into their business here. And so that will expand um, employment. Then we have the stimulus package for small and medium enterprises. Um, with these ones, the small enterprises, we're exempting them from payment of income tax. And so it will allow them to replow their profits back into uh, their businesses and be able to expand their businesses. Uh, we calculate that it will cost about one point, government about 1.4 billion a year. And so just imagine 1.4 billion a year going back into the uh, businesses. That should allow them to expand and be able to um, 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 grow their businesses. Apart from that, we have a youth entrepreneurship program that we're going to implement. It's a bit like the YES program. You know, the other time I said, I, one of my regrets was that we didn't expand the YES, yes program right. quicker than we did. We committed 10 million seed money to it, but I wanted to see how it worked before we went to the next level. And it worked quite, quite well. A lot of the people who were chosen, you know, were given capital in the form not only of money, but sometimes equipment. There's one of the young uh, guys who was uh, doing metal fabrication, and there were two pieces of equipment that he didn't have. And so the Youth Enterprise uh, Support Initiative gave him those pieces of equipment, and it made his work easier. As a result of that money that was invested, he employed two people to join him. You know, he had been working with his brother, but he had to take two more employees because then it made him able to, you know, expand his business. There was a lady, a young girl who finished a University of Science and Tech, and um, we gave her capital, and um, uh, we purchased um, aquaculture cages for her. Yeah, and she put it on the Akosombo um, 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 waters, yeah. and um, she employed 20 people, you know, in fish farming, and she the last. I checked, she was doing very well. So our young people have a lot of entrepreneurial mm. spirit. So, so that just that capital is a problem. Mm. And capital at an affordable rate. If you go to the banks or the microcredit institutions, mm. they'll give you the money at 6% uh, interest per month. And that is not money you can use for any proper business. It's only importers and things who need to clear things quickly at the port and come and sell. So it, that works for commerce, but it doesn't work for investments. Okay. You know, so that's one side. But there's also the public sector. We've done a human resource gap analysis of the public sector. And there are gaps in terms of human resource in many of the sectors. And so our intention is to fill those gaps. 
we estimate that we should be able to employ at least 50,000 young okay. people a year. So whilst you go around and there's a cry for jobs and you give them all this assurance of the big push, the one million jobs and all that, the question many keep asking is, where is John Mahama going to get the money from, especially when there is a record of high debt that the current administration is doing? In fact, uh, check in this morning, we are told that Ghana's debt, uh, Ghana's debt is two six three billion cities which the world bank has warned that may go up where is the money going to come from so it doesn't add up to the already ballooning debt this government has been very reckless with borrowing i mean if you think about the quantum of debt they've added to ghana's public debt stock it's it's unbelievable absolutely you know and it's going to go even higher i mean currently the debt to gdp is about 73 percent by the end of the year to be about 75 percent and that is way over the 60 percent recommended you know debt to gdp level and then aside from that the deficit by the end of this year would be about 15 percent mm. of gdp and so 15 percent deficit mm. when the target should have been below five percent mm. i mean it shows a very reckless management of the economy you know, and now they are putting all the excuse on, on COVID. But the economy was tanking already before COVID. Let me tell you something that happened. Last year, they were unable to, 2019, they were unable to, able to meet their domestic revenue target. This government is a very deceptive government. You know what they did? They went to two commercial banks and borrowed money at commercial interest rates against the accounts of two of their largest taxpayers and used it to fill the gap for last year and said oh they met the target i mean that's against the financial administration regulations completely criminal and yet that is the kind of thing this government does you know has a different set of figures for the public and the uh, 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 parliament and that's a different... has listed a gamut of things they've used the money and for. <laughs> i mean what just tell me anytime you ask they say free shs free shs is funded from oil revenues the abfa it's not debt it's funded from the ABFA. And how much have we spent on free SHS? 3.6 billion. Mm. It, it cannot account for that huge borrowing. But like you're saying, we started the idea of smart borrowing. You know um, Terminal 3? <clears throat> you know that Terminal 3 is not on the public debt. You, you are aware? Yeah. Yes, because what we did was we just released, we released the, a, a full passenger service tax you know, to Ghana Airport Company. We used to take 60% of it into the consolidated fund. We released the entire amount to Ghana Airport Company and said, look, improve your airports, do it on your own balance sheets. And it is based on that, the work in Kumasi, uh, the um, Accra Airport, Terminal 3, the work on the apron and everything were done. Meridian Port Services are partners with Gapoha. We wanted an expanded port. We asked them to uh, build and expand the ports you know, with their own, on their own balance sheets. And so they borrowed on their own balance sheets. It was not added onto the, the public debt. And so we can do smart borrowing. We're going to dualize the highways. When we dualize the highways, we're going to put toll uh, booths there, you know, so that we can recoup the money. Uh, Tama Motorway was built. We've recouped the money for the motorway many times over, you know. And so there are a lot of these things that you can do <clears throat> especially with economic infrastructure, so that you're able to recoup whatever you, you put into it. And so we're going to do smart borrowing. We're going to collateralize parts. You know we did an investment vehicle called the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, and we committed some revenues to it. We put $270 million there. This government has dissipated it. But that vehicle was going to be used as a, an a, a investment vehicle to attract funding to develop our infrastructure. We're going to reject that idea and commit part of our oil revenues into that investment vehicle. And we'll use that investment vehicle to okay. borrow, to invest in the economy. All right, so this is a one-on-one -on -one with the flag bearer of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama. We'll go for a quick break. And when we come back, we delve into the issue of corruption. So this is the one-on-one -on -one interview we're having with the flag bearer of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama. Uh,
on what he's been saying on his campaign tour. My name is Komla Kluche. Let's go to corruption. Corruption was a major issue in 2016. In fact, you were lambasted here and there over the issue of corruption. How do you rate the current government's uh, management of corruption issues or the handling of corruption and then its related issues? I'm sure you know the answer yourself. <laughs> you tell me. Well, a bit small. And it's not like the statistics don't support it. Just look at the transparency, uh, uh, corruption transparency index. Yeah? And you can tell the performance of any government in corruption. The worst year of our government, NDC, is better than the best year of this government in terms of corruption. You see, the thing, Kamala, mm. the thing about corruption is, it's not that it won't care. It will, it, it will come up. I mean, there are people in different places. Everybody has his own moral, you know, uh, uh, makeup. You understand? And so you might put somebody somewhere. He goes and does some wrongdoing and all that. The important thing is to strengthen the institutions so that the institutions work. It's how you deal with corruption when it comes up. Not that it won't happen. It will happen. Mm. But how you deal with it as a leader, mm. that is most important. Now, it's obvious that this president has no, absolutely no will to deal with corruption. He raised a lot of hopes with the issue of the Office of Special Prosecutor. I mean, what has come out of that office in four years? One, it is underfunded. You know, two, the special prosecutor's hands have been tied behind his back. And so he's not been able to prosecute anybody. He has no investigators. He has to rely on state institutions to give him investigators. Every year they announce a big budget for him. How much of that budget is released? But in a part, it's also the media. I mean, I said it the other time. The media is giving this government a free ticket when it comes to corruption. Because you set the agenda. In my time, every little issue was like, you know, blown up, sometimes out of proportion. But the thing about... Corruption is not little or big. No, I said blown out yeah. of proportion, whatever it is. But the thing about my administration was, I believe in regime accountability. Mm -hmm. And so if the matter will come up. If it comes up, you must find a way of dealing with it, either by investigating it. And, and our record is clear. Mm -hmm. I mean, we investigated all the issues the media raised and things. One of our members of parliament is sitting, you know, in prison, you know, uh, because of issues related with corruption. And so there was a will to deal with it. This government has no will to do, deal with corruption within the regime. The easiest way, way, uh, fight against corruption is to deal with your political opponents when you take over. Mm. And so if you go and pick one, two, three people and put them before courts mm. and say you are being strong with corruption, what of those who are engaged in corruption under your own administration? Why should Ghanaians believe you to fight corruption more than the MPP administration, especially when under you, you had the JIDA issue? The JIDA issue was prosecuted. They were prosecuted, and people were made to refund monies to the state. They were prosecuted. Which other issue? You've had uh, Zoom Lion. Uh, Zoom Lion was part of the JIDA issue. Yes. Yes. Attorney General has the docket. Zoom Lion went to court against government in that particular matter. And that's where we left it to this government. They've not pursued it. And the thing is, the wheels of justice grind slowly. The national service issue. We put 31 people before court. We sacked 110 people. That case, up till now, was handed over to this government. What have they done about it? How are it? you going to deal with it when you come to power? How will you deal with this and the many other issues? We'll, let the, institutions, we'll let the institutions yeah. work. You see that we have a lot of anti-corruption institutions. And aside from that, we have the laws to fight corruption. It is a political will that is uh, lacking. Mm. And so you don't interfere in the work of the corruption, anti-corruption institutions. Leave them to do their work. And the point is, when I become president, anybody who serves in my government, I'm going to give them a strong warning that if they come into conflict mm. with any issue to do, if they, if they have anything to do with corruption and any of the institutions mm. is investigating them, they can't expect mm. any political interference from me. Let's go to the issue of small-scale mining. You have said a lot about what you do. I mean, in we saw the crowd, the number of small-scale miners who <coughs> lauded what you were going to do for them. Uh, you again said that you would be 
there will be a mining board which would serve as an intermediary, so to speak, between the small scale miners and then uh, that. Now, what, what do you think that with the idea of the mining board coming on stream, the issue of Galamsey is going to be a thing of the past? Would we equally not see the depletion, the wanton depleting <coughs> of the environment? Um, what's the situation now? Go take, I, I saw one um, video on social media that showed the state of our waters in 2016, our river bodies, and what the river bodies look like now. The pollution is far more now under this regime than it was even under our administration. And besides what has happened is, this administration has done something in the small scale mining sector of taking the advantage to mine and giving it to their party activists, their chairman, their DCs, and then the rest of the people they have you know, put aside. And that's why you see a lot of agitation when we go to the mining communities because Galamse is taking place, but it is officially sanctioned Galamse. Mm. The party says, that, you heard it, the party saying Hiasika, mm. and so they should go and do mining to finance the political party activity. And so if you go to many places, they'll tell you the DC is involved in, in Galamse. The national executives of MPP are involved in Galamse. The thing is, if you say small scale mining or Galamse is illegal and it's not good, and so you want to put an end to it, put an end to it and let everybody sit down. But you don't, you know, let your people continue doing it and then you depri deprive others. Okay. Mining is not bad. Small scale mining takes place in many countries. Mm -hmm. If you go to the US, there are small scale mines. They are huge mines, you understand? It is how you arrange it so that it, they're able to do the mining properly and then reclaim the land after. The thing about the Galamseas is once they take the gold out of the ground, they just abandon the ground the way it is and they leave. So they are not subject to what we call an environmental okay. bond. Yeah. The big companies have to put some money down mm -hmm. as an environmental bond. Mm -hmm. Now if we arrange it properly, that whatever gold they extract, there's a board. And then we have all these graduates from the Takwa mm -hmm. School of Mines. Mm -hmm. We assign them to all the mining districts to supervise and make sure that they're doing the right thing and that they uh, adopt safe mining practices so okay. that people don't die in the process of mining. And then aside from that, and every income they get from the gold, a little is put aside for reclamation after they've finished. After they've finished, if they level the ground, they plant the trees and do everything, they get their money back. If they don't, that money will be used to hire somebody to come and do it. So under your plan, we will not see the depletion of the environment? Well, one of the things is we need to um, make a choice between our forest reserves mm -hmm. because one of the major um, uh, impacts of small scale mining is that they're giving mining concessions to people in forest reserves. Mm -hmm. And so between the gold that is under the ground and the forest reserve, okay. we need to make a choice which is more okay. important. And I'll always go for the forest reserve okay. because once that forest, natural forest is depleted, mm -hmm. you can never get it back to the same uh, level as it is. Okay. The other places where there's gold in areas that have been depleted of trees and things, mining can take place there normally. Because after you finish, you can level the ground again. You can put the topsoil back. You can plant the trees again, and it will come back to normal. Okay. We, we, we are far behind time, but there are about two issues that we'll have to look at. The, the electoral commission and then the issues in Nigeria, briefly. Let's, let's look at the electoral commission. You have uh, many say you've been a bit harsh on the current electoral commission you appear not to be confident in them uh, what areas do you want them to focus on and uh, that should see a free and fair elections well i think the first is um, the register um, that's one of the areas we should look at I, I'll, I'll, it will be unfortunate if on the day of the election people go and they can't find their names mm -hmm. in the register but then it will be too late to correct anything and that's why I've kept putting the pressure for them to make sure that we have a credible uh, register. That's the first one. The second one is the hardware they're going to deploy. Okay. You know, the thing is, you don't change hardware and software, you know, so close to an election. 
you know, they were a bit late in ordering this new, if they knew they wanted to replace, you know, the existing um, uh, 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 technology that we had for elections, we should have started a bit earlier. Right now, we've not had the opportunity to test this new system they've put in place. And so on the day, people might go and put their fingers on the BVRs and the BVRs don't work. It will make for a lot of chaos, you know, in the election. And so I've just kept warning the nation that this is likely so that they also sit up okay. and do the right thing. Mm -hmm. You see, I think that the problem has been a problem of competence. Okay. You know, throughout the history of the Electoral Commission, mm -hmm. they leave office by retiring. And so when somebody retires, a new person is appointed. He comes and meets two uh, commissioners there already. And so the institutional memory is there, and they continue working. Okay. He becomes experienced too. Mm. Then somebody retires, and then the person is replaced. Mm. You know, So it has always been an institution that has had institutional memory and continue okay. to work. In this case, three commissioners were removed at once, and three new commissioners brought in who have no institutional memory. They have no experience of conducting elections. And that is why we're seeing this very chaotic you okay. know, uh, an incompetent, mm. you know, uh, Finally, we've run out things, of time, yeah. but I need to pick your thoughts on this. Nigeria, uh, you've watched uh, the chaos on TV and all that has. The current chair of the ECOWAS uh, so far shown leadership to help Nigeria resolve the chaos we are seeing on TV. And what would you have done differently? You've been there before. What would you have done differently? Well, I can't talk about him, you know, but I just say that um, what's happened there is regrettable. Um, I, I saw some of the videos just yesterday because we've been in the rural area. Sometimes the connectivity has not been good. But yesterday I saw some of the uh, uh, pictures and um, they really were gruesome. Um, I don't believe that, you know, um, the security services should be so high handed, you know, against um, unarmed demonstrators. And so it is regrettable. But Nigeria is a country of strategic security interest to Ghana because we're the ne nearest English speaking country to Nigeria. If anything happens um, and causes chaos and disorder in, in Nigeria, it invariably affects Ghana, both in terms of the fact that we are like brothers, we're cousins, we live together. And then in terms of trade, um, the highest trade in West Africa is between Ghana and Nigeria. Mm. And so we have a, a very important interest in what goes on in Nigeria. And so I'll, I'll appeal that um, we maintain a level head. The generation of today, and that, that, that is what we've been warning about, we have a youth bulge. Our generation, our uh, population is very young, yeah. 35 and below 60%. Mm. And we've always said that it is an advantage in terms of having young, strong mm. labor. Mm. You know, but it's also a disadvantage if we're not able to find employment for them as quickly. Mm. And so the young people see that their opportunities are dwindling. Should, should they the ECOWAS have, no... have been more positive in this? Oh, definitely. And that's the final one. Definitely. I mean, ECOWAS is our um, a sub regional body okay. and uh, it's responsible for peace and security within the West African sub region. And so when you are the chairman of ECOWAS, you take an interest in what is going on in the other countries. Mm. I mean, I dealt with the Burkina Faso yes. uh, situation. I was ECOWAS chair at the time. I dealt with issues to do with Guinea-Bissau okay. and all that. I noticed the president dealt with the Malian, the Malian issue. Uh, situation. But yeah. he also should be very responsive to what is happening, not only in Nigeria, but also Cote d'Ivoire. Okay. I mean, you keep seeing the rioting that's taking place in mm -hmm. Cote d'Ivoire. I mean, ECOWAS must be proactive and must start to, you know, envision what interventions need to be done in order to bring peace to those countries. Okay. John Romani Mahama, many thanks to you. And uh, this is one of the many interviews we are hoping to have with you. And we are grateful for the opportunity you've given us. And uh, we will be expecting to have... Uh, many more with you. So that's John Dramani Mahama, the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress. He's been speaking to us exclusively here on TV3. And he's been talking about the many, um, many issues he's been saying on the campaign trail. Uh, we're hoping to have another interview with him as time goes on. My name is Komla Kluche. Thank you for your time.